Okay, it's 301. Howdy, my name is Susan Saab Fortney. I'm a professor at Texas A&M School of Law and director of our program for the advancement of legal ethics. And it's my pleasure to moderate this session. The webinar that we are hosting today is Excellence in Teaching Professional Responsibility Online. And this is part of a A&M series that we have conducted over the last few months on legal issues in the age of coronavirus and those various webinars, exam and issues that arose in connection with the CARES Act and COVID related legal issues. We uh, conducted one webinar that related to lawyering in a pandemic and post pandemic world. So if you're interested in any of those, you can find more information on the website at TAMU Law Answers Dot info, and we'll put that um, address up at the end as well. So today, what we're looking at is online teaching. And if you think back to the spring, so many people were thrust into online teaching with limited time to prepare. Since that time, I think we've had more time to reflect, prepare, um, view all sorts of trainings. There have been a number of trainings that have been conducted by groups like AALS and Cali, and those are all worthwhile. I encourage you to check those out. But what's different about our program is that our program is focusing on teaching professional responsibility online. And to cover those issues, we have four people that have been doing it. And they kindly have shared um, the, the time today and in planning this session and what they're going to do is work through their individual experiences, both in synchronous and asynchronous teaching. And so I'm going to briefly introduce each person. I could spend the hour going over their credentials, but instead I'll just stick to um, what their current position is. And I think many of you know these professors, and for those that, of you that don't, I hope you get to know them. One thing that we have, I think, is a very close professional responsibility community. And I think we all miss uh, meeting with one another and talking with one another. So the webinar today and at webinars that, that have been conducted by the ALS PR section over the last month or so have been very worthwhile in maintaining those connections. So getting to our four speakers. We'll first um, have Alberto Bernabe from University of Illinois, Chicago, and that was the John Marshall School of Law. He'll present first, he'll present a kind of overview. He'll be followed by Susan Carl, who is professor and vice dean at the Washington College of Law at American University. Next, we have Ellen Murphy. Ellen's a professor of practice and an Associate Dean for Strategic Innovations uh, Initiatives, excuse me, at uh, Wake Forest Law School. And the last professor that will present is Margaret Tarkenton, who's a professor at Indiana University McKinney School of Law. And Margaret will focus on teaching on an asynchronous basis. And the game plan is for each of them to present for about 10 minutes. That leaves time at the end for questions. In terms of questions with the number of people that we have participating in this webinar, it's hard to answer all the questions on the chat, but we encourage you to put your questions on the chat. And what I'm going to do during the session is to monitor the chat questions, combine as many as possible and that will allow uh, as many answers to get out there as possible. And before we turn to the presenters, what we wanted to do is just get a sense of the composition of the audience, the participants today. So we have first um, a polling question on what is your status? So if you could answer whether you're a full-time professor, adjunct or part-time professor, or neither of the above. Okay, well, good. Well, 
Well, it's nice to see um, a good 28% of the audience members are adjunct or part-time professors. And as I've uh, touched on before, I think that we see this as a community and are really pleased that the adjuncts who play an important role in teaching professional responsibility can join us today. And we also encourage you to reach out to not only the people that are serving as panelists today, but any of your full-time colleagues at the law schools where you teach. Um, so with that uh, polling behind us, let's look at the next one, which really uh, focuses more on your experience level with online teaching. So next question goes to how experienced are you with using Zoom features? All right, so there we have a good mix as well. So uh, a good half of our audience members are moderately experienced, and then we have uh, next limited experience in a smaller percentage who have no experience or are very experienced. So that's good because, uh, as I mentioned, Alberto is going to start off with more of a big picture. We're going to then go from the general to the specifics and the presenters also are going to demonstrate some of what they do. So Alberto, um, I'm gonna to turn to him in a hotel room. I have to tell you all, Alberto's a real sport. Not only did he make the effort to, to check out the internet and participate while he was traveling, but he brought his bow tie along as well. So Alberto, tell us, tell us about what you've been doing and provide that overview if you would please. Okay. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. I think I am unmuted um, and I am on video. Like Susan said, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes, which is not a lot of time. So I'm going to try to cover a lot. And if, if I mention something and I don't go into uh, depth and you want to, to ask me a question, of course, ask uh, uh, you can ask in the chat or after the program or even uh, grab my uh, email address and contact me later. I'll be happy to talk to you uh, or show you anything that I mentioned here. Um, uh, before I start, let me mention a couple of preliminary points. And one is that, as Susan said, I am uh, operating not from where I usually teach online, uh, which is breaking one of my rules that I would suggest, and that is that you always teach from the same place and have a good setup and all sorts of things. Um, and so if the video or audio uh, goes awry, I'll have to make some adjustments, but I hope you can hear me. I did bring my backup microphone um, on the trip so that you could hear me a little bit better. That's what it's going to be one of my suggestions. If you're going to invest on anything, invest on a good microphone. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. The other uh, preliminary points are a couple of warnings, sort of, uh, so, so to speak. And one is that anything that we talk about today may be affected or limited by your school's learning management system, uh, which uh, may be Blackboard, Moodle, Canvas, whatever it is. And so we, we may be giving you ideas that may or may not be compatible with that. Um, and by the same token, similar, uh, similar thing that um, things that we talk about in our experience uh, may be uh, relevant to our school in particular and the sort of what I'm gonna call the culture of the students. For example, if you have students who are very willing to participate or very active, very engaged, or the opposite, uh, then some of the things that we say may or may not work uh, as well. So, uh, so I guess my first Point, general point is to become uh, conscious and, and familiar with what you have to deal with at your school, particularly from the technical point in terms of the learning management system, because that may affect what you can do. Um, and then my last uh, point is going to be my uh, conclusion. I'm going to state up front, and that is that uh, when it all comes down to it, my suggestion is that if you're going to teach online, you try to combine both asynchronous uh, elements 
elements with synchronous elements uh, so that you get the advantage of both uh, because there are advantages and disadvantages to either and so uh, relying on just one um, in my opinion is, is can be enhanced if you do a little bit of both all right so let me talk a little bit about uh, synchronous uh, teaching which is what is uh, people are most familiar with because it's the closest that we're going to get uh, to a classroom experience. You have the advantage of having an audience and being able to talk to the audience, being able to listen to the audience. And for the students, the biggest advantage, the biggest advantage is that they can ask questions uh, in real time when they're uh, engaged with you. Um, so we, we understand and know the advantages of that. And I think most of us will gravitate towards synchronous teaching. But I want to talk a little bit about the disadvantages that a lot of times we forget and that can create real obstacles to, uh, to the, 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 the teaching that we want to have. Uh, personally, as an aside, my, in my experience, I'm not a huge fan of synchronous teaching. I try to do a little bit of both, but I emphasize more on the asynchronous part because of the disadvantages. Um, the main disadvantage, ironically, is that it relates to the main advantage too. The, the technology that we can use that allows us to do what we're doing today uh, can get in the way and become a real problem. Uh, it, it depends on having a reliable and fast internet connection. Uh, which not everybody has. Um, you can do something on your end about that uh, if, if you are if if you teach from your office or from home and you have control over that. Uh, but you but you can't really do much for the students. And this um, points to uh, what can become several uh, 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 severe sometimes inequities among students. If the students don't have the same access and they won't all have the same access to the technology. Uh, that can be a problem that can stand in the way of the effectiveness of your teaching to them. Um, things that you can do to counter this on your end, that of course, to make sure that you have good internet access. Like I said before, buy a good microphone, that is a key. If no one can hear you, if they can, cannot hear you very well, uh, internet teaching is not gonna be very effective. And the second one is to buy or invest in a good camera don't rely on the computer camera, typically the, com the cameras that come embedded with computers, whatever, however good your computer is, the camera is going to be the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, element in it. Uh, and you want to have a camera that is detachable from the computer so you can be at a good angle so you don't end up teaching in a way that people end up looking up your nostrils or down your bald head like me. Um, what program to use for any of this? Uh, it's, uh, there are a lot of um, possibilities. Um, I like Zoom because I like the, uh, the functionality of Zoom, but there are many others. And again, you may be limited by your school uh, system. Um, I can answer questions about that specifically and make recommendations about that later if you want me to. Last point about technology, uh, which I found the hard way, um, is do not assume that your students know and understand the technology uh, at all or as well as you do. Uh, if you're older like me, you can assume that they will understand social media better than you. I don't know anything about social media, but uh, I ended up finding out that I know a lot more about technology, professional type technology than they do. And you may find yourself in a position where you actually have to teach them technology. So if you don't understand the technology, you have to, you have to learn it before you can teach it to them. A second major obstacle that I found, uh, I found in teaching synchronously is the student's attitude towards being on camera. Again, this may be part of the culture of the law school or part, part of the culture of the students. Uh, but if you have students who are reluctant to be on camera, reluctant to participate on camera, that can be a real obstacle. There are ways to deal with that on how you teach, whether you want to emphasize lecture rather than calling on students like you're used to in the classroom, or whether you want to embrace the chat. The chat I found it becomes a real obstacle because students who don't want to participate and speak up start typing and before you know it, um, before you know it, the chat is full and you're teaching over here thinking that you're talking to them and they think they're talking to you on the chat and if you're not paying attention to the chat which i find very difficult to do while i'm speaking then um that's an issue um again i have 
lots of suggest specific suggestions on how to handle some of those some of those issues. Uh, the one that I'm going to mention that we're going to see the, uh, displayed later is they use an, an interactive polling. Polling is very popular. Students really like it. It's engaging. It keeps them. Uh, uh, it, it's almost like a game. Uh, um, they can answer without having to speak up or commit to an answer. And it works as a way to uh, you being able to give them uh, feedback uh, very quickly and uh, uh, as an assessment tool. So polling is really my go-to way to uh, get students to participate without forcing them to speak up. Um, in terms of appearing on camera, some students are very reluctant to actually uh, allow the video um, for any number of reasons. And we have to be um, aware of, of the fact that some of them don't like to share their environment, their, their, where they are sitting or where they are appearing and so on. Um, some schools require students to be on camera or they're, they're counted as absent. Others are more lenient about that. I, I guess that's up to you unless your school has a particular policy. Um, I like my students to be on camera and I have told them that, that I want them to be on camera. Sometimes they contact me um, before class and say they don't want to be on camera on a particular day and I am, I, I, give them a pass, um, but I do like to see them. And I, tell, I explain to them that being able to see each other is important as part of uh, building community and as part of being part of a group and the, and the class and so on and so forth, um, which is one of the more difficult things to do, I think, when you teach online, this, this notion of building community. Um, for uh, polling, I... Uh, as you know, Zoom, for example, we just saw it used, has its own polling system, but I suggest that you look into a separate polling app or system. Um, there are two that I have used that I like. One is called Poll Everywhere, uh, also known as Poll Ev, E-V, uh, and the other one is Vivox. Um, both have advantages and disadvantages. Poll Everywhere is easier to use, but it's not it's not uh, necessarily free and it allows fewer uh, answers. Um, then uh, I think I'm out of time already and I, I didn't even get to uh, asynchronous. Let me just say uh, a couple of things uh, about asynchronous. The asynchronous is more work, but it, but it does provide a lot of advantages to the students because they really appreciate, in my experience, they really appreciate the ability to study on their own and at their own pace, particularly if you prepare um, pre-recorded lectures. I can talk a lot about pre-recorded lectures. I, I am a big fan of, of creating pre-recorded lectures. I have, pre I have prepared pre-recorded lectures that are very, that have been very effective and, and some that are, that, that turn out to be not very effective for different reasons. The key to the pre-recorded lectures, I think, is to uh, keep them short and then use them in conjunction with other elements, not on their own. Um, and then uh, to use the other elements of asynchronous teaching uh, to create activities where they can answer questions, quizzes, things like that, that, that serve not only for assessment, but also to learn the material um, and, um, and, and to work on their own and then create questions that they can bring to the synchronous meeting uh, and talk. That was really fast. And I could, I could talk for a lot longer about any of these and other things, uh, but uh, I don't want to take any, anybody else's time. So I'll stop at that and be happy, we'll be happy to answer questions later. Very good. Thanks, Alberto. And Alberto, as I said, was, was broadcasting from a hotel room. One thing that we wanted you all to also appreciate is just the, sometimes the difficulty with technology. And one thing to do when you have some issue in terms of technology is to actually shut off your video. And we had mentioned that. So um, we didn't do so here. We all wanted to connect, but you might keep that in mind going forward. All right, next we're going to turn to um, Ellen. And so Ellen actually has advanced training in terms of teaching technology. So Ellen, share with us what you do if you would. Ellen, you're muted. 
Excellent. Thanks, Susan. Um, you should be seeing my screen right now. I'm Ellen Murphy at Wake Forest. I know a number of you, but not all of you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I've been teaching online since 2008. I've taught in synchronous, asynchronous, blended. I've used various components in my live classroom. I've taught in the um, high flex that is all the rage right now where you're in the classroom with students and some are online, which is um, quite a challenge in my opinion. Um, and so I just want to share a little bit with you about my experience. My, my job here is today is a narrow one in that I'm going to talk about fostering engagement in the synchronous online classroom. Um, but I hope what you all leave with after this is a recognition that transitioning to this online venue really is an opportunity for us. It increases access in a number of ways for our students, for people to join our classrooms. Um, so I hope just talking about it and being with folks who've done it, who've tried things, who agree and disagree on ways to do it will help you all um, get a little excited about it and um, maybe feel empowered and a little less nervous because it is it is um, it can be it can be nerve-wracking we've mentioned synchronous and asynchronous I'm going to talk about synchronous today but I would encourage you as Alberto pointed out to think about both components and to put them on a spectrum and when you're thinking about your class and how you might design your class and what you might do to think about what makes sense for you individually. I think one of the things that we get wrong in moving to online teaching is we stop being ourselves. And we need to be ourselves in our online classroom in the same way that we are in our physical classroom. This is a scaffold. And I show just the image because when you're planning this, and you want to play to your strengths and the strengths of your technology, if you think about scaffolding that student learning, right, introducing the rule, have them reading the rule, have them exploring the rule, hearing you talk about it through an asynchronous video, and then maybe bringing them into a synchronous classroom to do some analysis and application, that's what I do in my classroom. That's how I scaffold my learning. So let's talk a little bit about polling. I think in PR there's two ways to use poll. Well, there's lots of ways you can use polling, but there's a couple ways that are um, particularly good for PR. One is the either students love it, maybe professors hate it, MPRE review. Um, I will put questions on my screen like this, MPRE questions, and then I will launch a poll. And I'm showing you this because I do something pretty unique. I'm not asking you to get the answer to this question right. But Zoom requires you to copy and paste the answers for your poll into Zoom. Well, I may go through on an NPR review day, I may go through 18 questions. And I don't want to spend the time putting them into Zoom to them have them um, to have to do that before each synchronous class. So I create a generic poll. My students have the question on their PowerPoint slide. I can then use the technology and the venue to be more nimble and add questions, right? Decrease questions um, and do things without having to ha be, be married to both this, these, these polls that I have put into Zoom beforehand. This has worked really well for me. Um, you can do end polling. You all can now see that we have a pretty clean break with not a lot of people answering. Um, but this is a real good way to use polls without having to create a new poll and an ability to just open a poll in your classroom. You could have a generic one that's true false. You can ask a question that you weren't planning on asking, right? Because that's the magic of the synchronous classroom. That's the magic of that time that we have with our students. You can have some, some in the can polls that allow you to ask questions and get real time data from your students about their level of understanding without having to plan all of that before you come to class. So I will keep a true false one and I like to, um, I always, well, I don't always, I've only had it a couple of years, but I'll throw this lawyer ad up and say, does this comply with the model rules? And I'll throw up a, a pre-canned, a canned poll that says yes or no. My students will answer and then maybe I'll change it and say, well, does it comply with the rules in Kansas, which is clearly where we are, where this, uh, where this ad has been placed in the park. So a way to use polls without being married to 
the the planning a way to take advantage of um, the natural flow of your classroom the second thing I want to do is show you breakout rooms tell you how I use them in PR and then actually put you into breakout rooms one disadvantage of the setting we're in today is I am NOT the actual host of this th of this zoom classroom you will be in your zoom classroom so I'm not going to be putting you into breakout rooms Kirsten is and I'm going to get you to do that in just a second Kirsten but not yet what I do with breakout rooms rooms is I use them for group work just like I would in my traditional residential classroom so this is a hypothetical that I use in my traditional classroom I typically put my students into groups I have them work through the hypothetical and then we go over it together so what I would do is one of two things put this on my screen and send them to their breakout rooms I might have them do it for homework and come to class then put them in the breakout rooms to talk about it and then bring them back into our larger classroom one tip I learned from some folks um, I was training this summer on online learning is when I send them into breakout rooms I assign roles so if your last name is the first in the alphabet you're gonna be the group leader and if your last name is last in the alphabet you're gonna be the reporter Right, and that gives them direction on how to start in the breakout room because otherwise they get in the breakout room and they all just kind of sit there and they don't say much. Now, um, I am going to have Kirsten now put you into breakout rooms. She's going to put four of you each together. This is just so you can see what it looks like for a student. You've probably been the teacher. You may have never been the student before. You're going to be put in a breakout room. You're going to be in there with three people, and then you're going to be brought back together. And we're just going to stay there for just about a minute and a half just to save time. So now you have a, a little a little bit of what a break how a breakout room works you could see that the host can display a message to the group the host can move through the groups um, and I did get one question that I'll share and then I'll stop and it was do I do I assign my students to breakout groups or do I have zoom uh, randomly assign them I typically have zoom randomly assign them just for ease I have 80 people in my PR class at Wake Forest um, and that makes it easier one good thing to know about breakout groups in Zoom is I can have a breakout group in the first 15 minutes. We can all come back in and then I can push a button and they will go to the exact same breakout room for that class. So there is no um, downside, whether well, there's no, that, that's not magic. You can also um, assign them to breakout rooms if that works better for you. And you can do it in such a way that those groups will stay together for the semester. Um, it's really just a matter of how you want to do that in your classroom. So questions, my email is up. I'm going to stop now and um, pass the hat on to Susan Carly, but I am happy to answer any questions now or later. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much, Susan, for putting this together. And thank you both, Alberto and Ellen. I've learned things already uh, from you. And that the idea of having a generic poll is genius. I'm going to do that a lot. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about my uh, legal ethics classroom or professional responsibility class that's online. Um, I am not a, a, a natural um, uh, candidate for teaching in this format. I'm sort of a technophobe and uh, as you'll see. Um, but um, I started online teaching because we had started a master's in legal studies and I wanted to be supportive of that program. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to force myself to learn some of this stuff. And this was several years ago. And so I developed a course called Ethics and Law and Public Policy. Um, and this was in collaboration with 2U, which some of you may know is an, an online um, education content company. And so I was forced uh, in developing that course to learn a lot about uh, best practices in online teaching. It was very arduous for me. It was hard. It really stretched me. And sometimes I felt very uncomfortable. But it's often true when you feel uncomfortable. I learned a lot from the experience. So when I got out of doing that, and I, I designed the course, but I am not sure I would teach it again though I enjoyed very much teaching um, non-law students, um, I, I wanted to take the skills that I had and develop a course that combined our required PR course 
uh, with students being located in a practice context. And I decided the best way to do that would be when they were in their summer jobs. Um, I wanted them to think about ethics in practice context and in conjunction with the sociology and history of the legal profession. Um, so I found a book that I found very well suited uh, to doing this, which is Anne Southworth and Catherine Fisk's uh, Ethics in the Legal Profession. And I de developed a course kind of around that book and also in uh, using my new skills in flipping classroom teaching. Um, and I, at that point, I had no idea COVID was coming, you know, no, no plan at all about the fact that I might actually <laughs> need to do this. Um, so the idea of a flipped cl classroom is that you try to take the stuff that's imparting basic information, the sort of short lectures that Alberto talked about, that kind of information transmission stuff that's more passive, uh, and you take that outside your live session and put it into your asynchronous teaching so that students can access it in a way that works best for them. They can watch it over and over again. They can speed it up if they're fast oral processors. They can slow it down if they're slower. They can take notes. They can, you know, be comfortable as they're doing it. And then you leave the space for your uh, live classroom uh, sessions for the most engaged active learning that you can um, use. And so this is, you know, includes things like discussion, critique, application, and that kind of thing. And this kind of maps onto Bloom's taxonomy, if I can share my screen. Hopefully, hopefully you're all seeing that. So this is something that I really didn't know anything about it until I was introduced to it by our Office of Online Learning. But so it's sort of the lower level skills are things like recalling facts and basic concepts, which obviously is stuff we absolutely need to be doing and teaching our students understanding those concepts. And then as you go up the taxonomy, you start applying a lot of facts, analyzing, and then evaluating and critiquing. And then finally at the tippy top is, you know, doing your own creating uh, of new ideas and content and all of that. And um, that kind of can map onto one way of thinking about the division between asynchronous and synchronous teaching. So asynchronous is a good time for the understanding and remembering and learning the concept stuff. And then when you get into synchronous or your live classroom, you can be practicing the higher level skills of applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating, which of course are very much hands-on skills. Um, and so that's sort of the way I think about how to, what goes in asynchronous and what goes into my live classrooms. Um, and now I have lost my notes. So hang on just one second. Like I said, I'm not very good at this. Okay. So, um, that's kind of uh, what I was trying to do. And of course, I think in, in COVID times, we have to really realize that we do not want our students having to sit passively in front of computer screens. We all know what that's like from spending our lives on Zoom, or at least as an administrator, I spend my whole day and night and, uh, you know, on Zoom, and it's very exhausting. So we want what's happening when they're sitting in front of a screen in the live classrooms to be as much engaged learning using the breakout rooms that Ellen just um, uh, demonstrated and discussions and that kind of thing. And I personally have found that my students love it. They're very participatory. And when we moved from, I moved from an in class um, setting to online, like everybody else halfway through last semester, I found that students who were really quite hesitant to speak in my class were surprisingly active online. Um, so the hand raising function allowed me to really manage students uh, very well in the discussion. Um, I did not find that students talked over each other because Zoom won't let you do that. And I actually thought my discussions were uh, more intimate and better than they had been in the, in the classroom and I didn't have a very good classroom setting. Um, so I, it, I, it actually in many ways uh, worked out better. So I just want to talk about seven things I use async for. Um, so first of all, I use quizzes to test students' completion and absorption of assigned reading. I have some multiple choice questions they have to answer and I still use them, but I actually find it even better to assign short answers. So an example, I might ask students to explain the difference between model rule 4.3 and 4.2 and explain when each applies. And then I grade these uh, prep assignments just for completion and I skim over them and I can start class knowing that everybody understands the basic concepts and that we can have a much more interesting discussion that's sort of critiquing and looking at underlying policies and that kind of thing. 
Um, other times I use async to tee up complex questions that I want to cover in class discussion. So an example would be I would assign a chapter from the uh, Southworth and Fisk book on the future of the legal profession. And I'd ask the question, how do you think technological, technological change and globalization are going to affect your career in the legal profession? And I'd get very great thoughtful sort of, you know, um, writing on it, which I, you know, I'm not grading for, I'm not grading, so it doesn't have to be beautiful, even though students tend to assign, hand in something that's quite polished. And I review those before class, and then I can organize them a bit and say, I, I saw some of you focused on this and some of you focused on that, and then I can use that to kick off uh, class discussion. Another thing that I've done that I'm really happy about is using async to cover a topic that I want to squeeze in but doesn't really fit into class. And an example of this is I really care about covering model rule 1.14, client under disability. And uh, some years ago, the head of our student um, disability rights organization came to me to complain that we didn't have enough of that in our ethics classes. And so I said, great, why don't you help me create some content? So I brought in our resident expert, uh, Professor Bob Dinnerstein, now our acting dean, uh, and uh, this um, student, and I had another uh, clinician there, and we did a simulation based on a fact pattern that I had um, recently consulted on. Um, and so we modeled the beginning stages of discussing the case on video, and then we turned to the camera and we asked students to finish the analysis, and that's their assignment, their async assignment for the week. And I got really good write-ups. Students really liked it. I graded that one, uh, so they knew I cared about it. And uh, they really did a great job. And then they just brought that material up in class. Um, and I, you know, even though I didn't have time to really cover it a lot in, in the live uh, sessions, um, I'm trying to get our other ethics professors to work together to create a library of this kind of material based on each of our uh, fields of expertise. I haven't quite gotten there yet and COVID is kind of inter interrupted, but I am hoping that we'll be able to do that. Um, I assign videos so students, um, we don't have to spend time in, in live sessions watching the videos, they'll have watched them beforehand. And then obviously I, I, I take all the short lectures that I tend to embed in my uh, Socratic teaching and I flip them into async content. To me, that was the hardest part of this because um, I think in law teaching, we're sort of trained by having been taught this way to move up and down the teaching pyramid that I just showed you in sort of five minute increments. So we're, we start with laying out the basics and then we're up into analysis and critique and then we come back to um, a new, topic and laying the the basics and then moving up and down. So it was really hard for me to think about taking some of the stuff out of the live classroom. Um, but I do find that it, it works, but it, it, is, it is real work uh, to do it. And then finally, what I'm most excited about with my new course is that I can use async the async content platform as a place where students can create their own class. And so what I have been doing is asking my students to interview a lawyer in a field in which they're interested in practicing and to ask them a general set of, of questions about th their practice area and what kinds of ethics you know, in general terms, so they're not um, saying anything confidential, but what kinds of um, ethics issues they face, what's challenging, what's rewarding about their jobs. Um, and the students um, can, uh, can only be a five to 10 minute long video, and then they have to upload the interview. And the next week, the, uh, students have to choose six of their colleagues' interviews and watch them and, and use a, a discussion um, uh, forum to respond and, and, and talk about uh, what they got out of watching the videos. Um, one of the things this exercise has really taught me is you can see a clear division between the students who know a lot of lawyers and the ones who don't. So I offer at the start for students, if they don't know somebody in a practice field they're interested in, uh, th I, I invite them to just let me know. And then I reach out through our alumni office to uh, alums who practice in that area. And that also has a lot of advantages. Alums really like uh, being contacted in that way. Um, and so I find that very rewarding and I find it to be 
really helping me with this goal that I have for the class of having students really understand the wide diversity of places in which they may end up practicing and all the different things that lawyers do and, and how they experience um, their positions um, in their practice lives. So I have a video, but I think I'm not gonna show it because I don't really think I need to, but um, it, it was just of a, a student interviewing a, um, a practitioner and I'll just tell the punchline so I don't have to try to show the video. Um, so this is a student who's really, really wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. And she asked me to uh, arrange for her uh, to talk to somebody who was in, in criminal law, either as a defense lawyer or as a prosecutor. And I happened to find her somebody who was a prosecutor. And the first question she asked, the prosecutor comes back and says, you know, I was dying to be a criminal defense lawyer my whole life. And it just so happened that in my clinic experience, I was assigned to a prosecution clinic instead of a criminal defense clinic. And I realized that if I wanted to do good things for the world, I should be a progressive prosecutor because then I would have um, more of a chance to make a difference. And, and you can see this student, just like this light bulb going off in her head, like, oh, wow, I never thought that being a prosecutor could ever be you know, something I'd want to do. So um, I really have enjoyed online teaching and I encourage you, even if you think that it's scary, which it absolutely is, <laughs> um, but I, I do think there's a lot of things that we can do um, to be creative and to reach our students in new ways that, um, that they, they appreciate and respond to. Great. Thanks, Susan. I'll say here, uh, Susan mentioned her colleagues were possibly developing a library of resources, and that's something that we want to do out of this session, is to invite everyone to participate in what we will create a kind of crowd, uh, crowdsourcing document that includes all sorts of resources. So, for example, people on the chat have listed various links for responder systems. Uh, there have been other suggestions on the chat in terms of videos. And what we'll do after this webinar is circulate the information so you can contribute to that resource list. And then that can be shared pretty widely. So Susan, thank you for your suggestions. I, for example, have learned a lot already. I used, I have been doing students, um, having students interview lawyers for years, but I hadn't thought about this idea of having them then share the interviews. And that's another way that technology allows us to do more. So thank you. We don't have very much time, but we don't want to cut into Margaret's uh, 10 minutes. So Margaret, if you would share with us what you do in terms of your asynchronous teaching. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so you can see this is actually my uh, professional responsibility course from the last spring, which actually I was doing before COVID. So uh, it was not like a surprise. Um, but what I first want to say is when you're teaching an entirely asynchronous class, which this is, um, the, there are some advantages to that. Uh, students actually love to learn on their own. As Alberto said, I actually have a lot of students like it. Um, I generally get pretty high teacher evaluations in this class, but it has to be amazingly well organized. And that's kind of the trick. Now this is in Canvas and your, um, your school may have a different, um, I'm blanking on what they're called, but a different uh, learning um, software to use. And so you might not have this as a resource. But if you look, for example, in this, um, each week is broken down so that students absolutely cannot get lost. They all know exactly what they're supposed to do in the class. And every week is totally structured and prepared in advance. It takes a lot of work to create a good asynchronous course. Um, you can do it with bells and whistles and pictures. Mine is pretty blasé that way. But um, if you want to look, for example, uh, everything is broken down. The students can come in. There's an instruction page for every single week. The instruction page will tell the students exactly what they need to do for that week. 
Um, so there's no confusion. I also, and this was a suggestion made to me by the CTL folks who helped me put this together, uh, is that there is something due, a quiz, an assignment, or a discussion question every single, in this class, uh, Thursday and every Saturday at midnight. Um, you can pick two different days. I think this year I'm gonna be doing Wednesday and Saturdays, uh, so it's spread out a little more. But the idea is that when you introduce the course to them and in the syllabus, you explain every single a Wednesday, you have something due in professional responsibility. And every single Saturday, you have something due in professional responsibility. So that students know that, and that's just an expectation. Now, when I say something due, uh, I mean that kind of your basic way of organizing a, a synchronous course is you have your students read something, watch something, do something. Now, it's not always in that order, um, in fact, something that I've done this semester that I've really liked that's not reflected in this course is I've started making case preview movies where I just make a couple minute lecture video that introduces the case and the things that I want them to watch out for in the case. And so then when they're reading it, they already kind of have, I know it's a little bit of a spoiler alert, but they know what they're looking for. And that's one of the great things about asynchronous teaching is you can target it very tightly. Um, and what I mean by that is that in a, a live classroom, um, and when I teach professional responsibility live, um, sorry, I'm going to a different week. I will, for example, tell the students, read everything on attorney-client privilege, um, and they read, you know, 30, 40 pages, and then we come, we talk about it for an hour and a half. So you have these large reading assignments and then large, long classes where I go over it. But as you can see on this, for example, I first just have them read pages 241 to 42 of the case book. So they're just reading two pages before they watch the first video. The first video is very short. Then I have them read the few pages that are on the introductory stuff about the attorney-client privilege and the basic um, elements. And then there's a lecture on that. And then uh, I have them read the stuff about corporate attorney-client privilege. And then there's a video. And then finally, um, they have just a couple pages they read and they do the work product. Um, then they will have something due they will have quizzes. So here, once they've finished reading all the attorney-client privilege stuff, they have a quiz that tests their knowledge on if they understood the attorney-client privilege materials. And after they have the waiver stuff, they then have a quiz on waiver. Um, so you can then test them on what they had, were supposed to get out of the asynchronous videos. So that's one way to make sure that they are actually paying attention. Now, some things that I do that are PR specific that I wanted to mention, going back to um, module one, is I start my course with this assignment. And so, if it will open, um, I have a little short introductory lecture about what lawyers do and who they are um, involved with, that they deal with courts, they deal with opposing counsel, they have deal with clients, and then they have to write for themselves, this is the very first assignment, their own personal understanding of their professional responsibility in 100 to 300 words. Um, students actually tend to take this very seriously and they do a decent job of it, um, but it also lets me know where they're starting from and it's personal. Instead of just being you know, your professional responsibility is what we tell you it is. They have to uh, express for themselves what they think it is. And then I have the same assignment as my very last assignment, uh, where they then articulate their professional responsibility um, now that they've finished the course and they are vastly different. I usually will have a couple students who don't take the last one very seriously, but on the whole, 
their final product is really quite good and they've really you've seen their development in understanding what their obligations in the system of justice and what their role in the system of justice is. Um, a couple other assignments that I do that I really like um, is I have students look up an attorney that they know so they can go to the role of attorneys and look someone up and see how easy it is to find discipline so that they know if they're ever disciplined, the whole world will know. Um, it's so, and students actually tend to enjoy that one. And then another one that um, is one that I can't do in class the same way at all deals with mental health. So I have my students um, actually are required to go to the JLAP website for Indiana, which is where I teach, and to look through it and to see what resources there are and to actually um, engage in some sort of self-reflection on how they're doing on that. Um, and so they can see those resources and they are required to do that. In addition to doing that, if I go to the, um, sorry, to the overarching, the instruction page for that, you'll see that I also can include, and this is something you can do on in synchronous very easily, um, you know, the resources from the American Bar. Um, they have a mental health toolkit. And so students can actually look at that and uh, access those resources directly. Um, and my last silly note, I also make them watch jo John Oliver's public defenders piece, which is pretty amazing. Um, and is funny, but very serious. So those are kind of my um, hints on asynchronous. The big thing again is organization and making it so your students know exactly what is due um, and that they have something due, something that checks or that applies uh, what they have learned in the lectures um, on set days every single week so they don't get behind. And I would just say one other thing that I love about asynchronous is that there is no hiding. Um, in a live class, we have students who sit in the back uh, or who kind of bunker down, who you try to call on everyone, but most in a large class, you're gonna call on them once or twice in the semester. My students in this class, we have discussion questions due every single week. And I read them all and I comment on them. There is no hiding and I know where every single student is at in the class. And that is one of the great benefits of asynchronous. Super, well, thanks, Margaret. We're getting to the end of the hour, but I wanna pick up with what you just said because it actually tied into one of the questions. And one of the questions really asked about you know, what's the pressure on students to engage when you're teaching in an asynchronous um, format? And I think you just hit on it, which is that basically requiring them to do something and not just be purely passive. Another question that was posed online that I'd like to present to the, the panelists is um, how to handle chat questions. So during your class, if you're teaching on a synchronous basis, that you're going to get those chat questions. So one, one possibility in dealing with the chat questions is to not try to do them when you're doing everything else, but to actually look at the chat questions doing a break. And people who uh, basically deal with learning and, and uh, how long people can sit still, uh, say that after you know, 25, 30 minutes that people get antsy. And we're not accustomed to taking breaks 25, 30 minutes into our regular in-person classes. But if you take a break during an hour and a half class, you know, that may be the time to look at those chat, those chat questions. So that's my suggestion. Let me turn to the, the panelists. What would you uh, suggest in terms of how to deal with the chat um, during a live class? Susan, it's Alberto. I have... Uh, two comments. One, the first one about the first thing you said, what uh, pressure there is to engage in the asynchronous part. Um, it's, it's important to remind the students that the 
to do part, I also think of, of in terms of uh, something to read, something to watch, and something to do for my students. And I actually tell them, use that phrase when I explain it to them. But the thing is that uh, it's important to explain to them that the to do part is not only an assignment uh, that they have to do, it's also an assessment. It's also a way for them to, to realize how well they're doing. And in my experience, my students really appreciate that. Um, it is more work for them, but uh, in my evaluations this summer, I taught the class online this summer, um, I got a lot of very positive comments about the, uh, the quizzes and questions. I call them questions for class discussion. Uh, I have them answer them after they watch the, uh, either before or after they watch the pre-recorded lecture, but before we go into the synchronous meeting, um, and they, they always, or most of them at least, appreciate it as, a, as an assessment tool. Uh, for the chat, uh, that's exactly what I do, what you just said. I, I just take a break and say, let me, let me take a break and look at the chat, and they take a break while I'm looking at it, and then we come back. It's, it's not a long break. It's just a couple of minutes while I go through if there's anything in there. Um, so anyway, that's my suggestion. Thanks. One really useful um use of the chat room I have found in class is when we're all talking about something and it involves some facts and the question is what 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 are the actual facts students are just so speedy about going right to the internet finding the link and putting it in the chat room and instead of you know that, that there was always that feeling when you're teaching in person you're up there in front of the class and everybody else sees whatever it is but you don't but this way everybody can click on it and you can have a discussion with a, you know the news article or whatever in front of you. So um, I find students have, students have taught me uh, to use the chat in that way. Very good. Other observations? How about closing remarks? We're right at the, at the um, four o'clock central time. We said we'd wrap it up. Um, so how about closing remarks from each of the panelists? A minute or two? Anything to add? If not, um, the last. Let me check my. All right. Well, thank you all. A special thanks to the panelists for their time sharing their experiences. As I mentioned, this is on the chat. This session will be recorded, so if you have colleagues that couldn't make it, you can share that, that link. That'll be sent out. And um, as I mentioned at the outset, we have a number of these webinars that you can access on our Texas A&M website. So thank you all again for participating. We wish you the best semester. Um, let's all make online teaching even better than our in-person teaching. So we look forward to hearing about your experiences and getting together again as a community. So we wish you and, and yours uh, safety over the next few months. Thank you again for participating.